That's one of the things. So uh, let's talk about let's talk about that Doug. No, it it doesn't matter. Sorry. (laughs) I I can I'll debate you to the grave about who (laughs) owns the event type name. Okay. Well, actually, I'd like to get Mark's opinion. On that. So, wait, wait. Cage match. Cage match. So, the, unless you guys have things specific to talk about the SDKs, I, I wouldn't mind talking about this and getting Mark's opinion on it. Okay. Um, one. Oh. What, so one thing with the SDK is that I've added tracing and analytics to the Go SDK. Hmm? So out of the box, you can. Well, you 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 opt in to expose those metrics using an exporter using um, Open Census, and so now you can do. Like if you want to expose it to like Prometheus, you could get metrics on how many times like you get an error response and things like that from all your endpoints. So that's pretty cool. And I'll have a cool Knative demo of that. You can also expose it to like the, um, the other analytic tracking things that like, like uh, Google Cloud uses. So we can do tracing all the way through your application and the the trace boundary doesn't stop at your code. It will go through in the SDK and come back out. That's cool. So it's going to be sick. <laughs> so, so that, that one's ready for a review? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right. Um, I, you know, again, I need to get back up and running because uh, all my, all my uh, setup is broken, but, you know, I'll get there. Um, okay, so the to catch Mark up on this debate, Doug believes. I mean, so here's <laughs> believe. I like that. Go ahead, Scott. Go ahead. <clears throat> uh, Doug sits on a tower of uh, misconception. There you go. Much better. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. So, so let's say we have uh, the a project that is going to expose cloud events from. Um, a, an event producer that does not produce cloud events. Who the the reverse DNS name of the entity that emitted that event should be a GitHub. Well, wait, 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 or... no, wait, 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 no. You didn't phrase it quite right. What we're talking about here is not just 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 not generically the reverse DNS name. What we're talking about here is what goes in the event type field in the cloud event. The, the field name matters. Uh, the, what do you mean the, the field name is set by the cloud event spec? The, what I mean is the, who, who, the, the, the fact that we're sticking this value into the type field of the cloud event is, is, is very important to this discussion, is my point. Yeah, we, we create it. So there is a, um, there's an adapter in Knative that takes in a generic event and produces a cloud event. Right. And then, and then sends that new cloud event on into the cluster. Knative took the opinion that we created that event because it's not from the originator and therefore it is our event and we need to, it's a reverse DNS with like dev.knative.eventing.github. Right. Now, my opinion is that the, the entity that is, in essence, wrappering, wrappering this event from GitHub to turn it into a cloud event is more like a proxy to me. It's a piece of middleware. It's not really pertinent to the flow of this message, uh, other than it happens to be the one that, that wrappers it, and that the receiver of this event does not care that the entity that wrapped it in a cloud event was a Knative thing. What it wants to know is that this event type is a GitHub event type. And so the fact that Knative appears in the field called type is actually a mistake. Well, it but should... we, we get to choose how much or how little of the GitHub event we pass along. I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with that statement. However, <clears throat> like I said, from an end user perspective, I don't care that Knative was in the, it was the piece of middleware that actually created the cloud event wrapper. What I care about is that it, it is a GitHub event type. And I would ideally like to just see the raw event type coming from GitHub. But if we do want to try to adhere to the cloud event spec and do a reverse DNS name on it, I would prefer that we, if we're, 
if we're going to make one up because GitHub doesn't provide us one, I would rather make it up like com.github.something and not right. a so, native so name then there. What do you do in the case where uh, two people write a GitHub source, they both do this middleware part, and they both make different opinions about how the data internally gets serialized? Uh, say that one more time. Like two authors make a different uh, middleware piece from mm -hmm. uh, an entity that doesn't actually make cloud events. So now they get to say, this was actually from com.github and uh, it's a pull request, but I've made some decisions about what that means mm -hmm. because yeah, I... they weren't a cloud event and now they are. Yep. And now you have two events on the, on the, in the cluster that are both from a source of the, the particular pull request. And they're both of type com.github.pull request. Yeah. Those I, don't work. As a receiver, I will, I will adjust accordingly because I'm, I control what's in my system, basically. And if I need to differentiate between those two, I can look at things like the source. No, the source is the, the entity that emitted that event. That would be the pull request UUID. Right. So there's no differentiating factor that you can look at in the envelope that tells you that that, that middleware made decisions for you other than a custom event type. So I want to make sure I understand. You're saying that from the exact same, potentially, GitHub issue, this event goes through two different pieces of middleware. Yep. Okay. I think that's kind of a weird setup. But if so, then that's the environment the user has chosen to install, and they're going to have to figure out some way to deal with it. Ultimately, like I said, I don't think the end user should know that Knative is in the picture. It's well, and maybe you're just no, 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 prickly no. about Knative. I, can let, let, let me interject something, which is I don't think that we want we want to be in the business of usurping other people's namespaces. Exactly. Well, so I don't. Like, that, that to me, that's a secondary issue. I, I I was just making something up. Like I said, I would prefer if we just use the event type directly from GitHub, even if even if it wasn't. No, 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 no. I think I think it's a first order issue, which okay. is we cannot we, we should not be having other people name things, com GitHub. Yes, that that's is funny. you know just being a good internet citizen. You don't you don't use someone else's namespace even though it is coming from, from, that, uh, from, from that service. Now, you can say, well, what should it be named? And is it that the person that is creating, that you know, has an event driver, that they might say it's com.github.myorganization.myrepo that contains the event driver? That might be something that would be more palatable but that's the source URI. Now you can point all the way back to the original uh, actual PR if that, that's what's causing the event. I, I don't want to get too hung up, hung up on the values we actually choose there. All well, I, that's all, the entire point of the spec. That's like well, well, the spec. No, my, my, my point here is if you have a piece of middleware that is wrappering an event, I don't believe it's necessarily appropriate for that piece of middleware to show up in the event type itself. I'm not saying it can't ever happen because I don't want to ever say that, but in cases like this, the it's, event... not, it's not middleware. That's what I've been trying to tell you. It's the K native source is an application that's doing something that has logic. It makes choices. Okay. 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 What, what we have stated about middleware is that it should not touch the thing if it passes it on uh, as is. But if it is, if, if it, but it can, a middleware can be both a consumer and a producer. So if it is consuming an event and then producing an event, then when it's producing, it should put a different event, event information into it because it is a new event. See, I, I would disagree that in this particular case, Knative is the event producer as we sort of defined it. I think it's more middleware because it is not the one that is producing the event. It happens to be the one serializing it, but it is not producing no, the it's event. It's literally the one producing the event. It is an application that is 
hosted by uh, your cluster that is going to take in a web a webhook request from GitHub that's its own format, makes some choices about how it takes that piece and then forwards on more metadata about that that in, that, that webhook request. Right, and I think that's a fundamental it's all dependent on the version of the library that we're using to consume the GitHub webhook because they're super complicated and really uh, uh, shadowy. So I so I understand what you're saying, and I think I think this actually may be the real crux of the difference of opinion is you're viewing Knative as like like you said the event producer. The fact that the the original data that we're talking about came from someone else is actually irrelevant to you. It's almost as if it's almost as if Knative is producing it. No, 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 no. Let, let, let me let me just finish because to me. I would like to get it to be more the situation where if I write a piece of code and I'm receiving an event from GitHub directly, if I turn around and drop that code into Knative and I'm getting it from K you know, getting it from the Knative infrastructure, if both Knative and GitHub can both produce cloud events, I'd want the same code to work in both places as best as possible. Yeah, that, that, that'll work. Well, it won't work though, because it, it only doesn't work because GitHub doesn't produce cloud events. Well, but, but this goes back to a question I asked you on Slack. If GitHub were to produce a cloud event, I asked you if you would have the Knative infrastructure <clears throat> still change the type to remove the GitHub, the, the, the com.github stuff and replace it with, with Knative, and you said yes. No, I, I didn't say that. Uh, I said that it that would be a different there would be a source that we're calling an ingress source and it would just pass it through. Well, then no, that would be a choice. Yes. But if you, if, if we used a GitHub event source, you said you would still want to change the type. If it's our code making a translation, but if the incoming request is a cloud event, then it doesn't need to change and we can remain all the keys stay the same. Okay. That, Cause that's, that. that if you produce the envelope, we own that envelope. And be because of API incompatibilities in the future, because we are locked down into a certain version of um, the, the API for GitHub for the web requests, we need to own that the, our namespace for that application that's doing the, the receiving and then the resending. Yeah, see, I, I think that's, that, that right there is basically the difference of opinion. I, I view this as middleware, and you view it as cloud native now actually owns the event. And I think that's just a difference of opinion. We own the code that, that did that translation. Oh, I'm not, I'm not disputing that, that the Knative owned the code that, <clears throat> that did the wrappering, but I was viewing it more as middleware where it's just acting more as a proxy. And yeah, it will add extra things to help things along, but it, it doesn't add things to make it look like it's the one that actually produced the event. I think that's a fundamental difference of opinion. It's it, but it, the source of the event is GitHub. So we didn't produce the event. We created the wrapper. Therefore, the the wrapper type is labeled uh, Knative. Yeah, but but go back to what I said earlier. As a as a end user of this event, I don't care that Knative is in the picture. I I want to know what the GitHub data is, not the Knative data. I but I think you're wrong because I think you do need to know because there could be multiple versions of GitHub wrappers. There could be many different opinions of how that GitHub data gets uh, wrapped and sent. And in that case, you, you would like to know exactly which application is doing that, the, the proxy work for you. Well, let me, let me put it this way then. <clears throat> if, if the Knative code is doing more than just in essence being a proxy or a simple wrapper, and it's actually injecting logic such that as a consumer of this, I fundamentally need to understand what Knative is doing because Perhaps it's not. Maybe you don't understand what Knative is. Because it's <laughs> <laughs> well, well, see, my, my point here is when I'm subscribing to GitHub events, I want GitHub events. I don't want Knative events. Then talk to GitHub and make them make uh, cloud events. Well, but that, but see, that's the point, right? They're not producing it now, but someone produced this, hey, this wonderful little utility called the GitHub event source in Knative who will do the subscription for me. Cool, I'm going to use that. Well, now I need to understand Knative's view of all the GitHub events, and I may lose something in the translation. That is exactly my point. 
you need to know that that translation and that's and that's something i as an end user should not have to think about and maybe i'm maybe i shouldn't be using the knative uh github event source uh you, you that's your choice you yeah. have to consume the webhook yourself from uh from github or create a different one that doesn't that doesn't pretend like it owns the data yeah you would not allow that in the ecosystem because it's a liar <laughs> it's a liar. <laughs> That's good. Anyway, Mark, there's there's the difference of opinion. No, I like it. I like it. I you know I think I think what would be worthwhile is to document some of these uh, scenarios into a GitHub issue for yep. cloud events and yep. see if we can I, get people to to uh, comment on them. I totally agree. I think I think this type of thing is a wonderful topic for the primer, especially for someone who's creating. Uh, quote event producers or middleware or whatever you want to call it because they need to understand what their what we think the expectation should be of them right yep but we don't agree no but, are you gonna put a put the primer thing to tell people what to do if, if well, uh, the cloud events members can't agree are, well all right for, first one to have the pr for uh best practices wins <laughs> Uh, well, I'm going to call my buddy, and uh, they're going to steal Doug Davis's laptop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I, I don't, I don't know that the person stealing your laptop is your buddy. Uh, well, you don't know that. Maybe I have his elaborate ring. Oh, there you go. See, see, this is the thing that always kind of worried me about these open space environments. Is <clears throat> especially in small startups, everybody seems to leave stuff lying around. It's not a big deal. And I always wondered how often things get stolen, and I never heard of it happening till now. So that that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's very very rare. Damn, like people will lost and found a, like a twenty dollar bill. That's honesty. I like that. Yeah, it's it's just like occasionally uh, somebody, you know, every once in a while someone will like smash through a window or uh, tailgate through the door and like. Usually they get caught. Sometimes they just steal a sandwich, and then sometimes they apparently snatch laptops. So, was your laptop taken like during the night or during nope. the day? Like during the day, like when everyone was coming in in the morning. Somebody. Oh crap! You know. that takes a lot of guts. <sighs> yep. Right. Got to be confident. Man, I would freak out. Was everything on your laptop backed up? Um, yeah. Yeah, everything is. You know, like I didn't lose anything. Okay, well that's good because I, I I think I would probably lose something if someone took my laptop. So I lost a bunch of cool stickers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all that matters. I understand. How am I ever going to get that OSB sticker back? Hey, I do have some extra stickers if you want for OSB stickers. I'll, I'll try to remember to bring them. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, say, say, send them a cloud events one as well. Yeah. So Scott, was it a real laptop or was it a Chromebook? No, I I I have a MacBook Pro. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Man, that sucks though. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, back to work related stuff. Anything else you guys want to talk about? Well, we, we are pretty keen on solving this difference of opinion about the, um, what goes in the header value for HTTP binary encoding. Do you mean the, the quote thing or the issue we were just talking about? Yeah, yeah the quote thing. Okay, I can't, I saw, I, I've been on phone calls the last couple hours. Um, did Clemens submit something? Like, could he ping me? I didn't see any update, but that wasn't, I haven't checked since last night. Okay, no, he did, he did something this morning. I just don't know which issues he touched. So hold on, let's see, he pinged me. Okay, yeah, he said he just, he just commented, I'm sorry, he modified the data encoding, I'm sorry, the data content encoding PR but not the, uh, the other ones yet. So we don't have an update on that one. Although we could ask on the call what his current thinking is. So. Yeah, because like the, it changes how that particular encoding works in the SDK if, if indeed we have to do something silly like quote stuff. Yeah, I'm really hoping we can find a way to get rid of the quotes. That just seems so bizarre to me. Or we can, we only quote things that are unknown to the spec is a, a workaround that it seems icky, but okay. Uh, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay. So the other thing I guess we should talk about at some point is we talked about doing some sort of SDK interrupt thingy, but I'm having a really hard time getting notice from the other SDK authors. Yeah. Um, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, well, no, I'm trying to, I may need to do a more, more direct formal reach out. You but, can start removing people's permissions. <laughs> if they don't notice, I'm not sure <clears throat> whether how I should take that. That might be really depressing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So people are starting to join. So we might want to switch topics. So, okay. Doug, I, you know, taking a look at the repos, uh, SDK Jet dash JavaScript was updated eight days ago, mm -hmm. 16 days ago. Python a lot, a lot further back. Yes. Anyway, I mean, there, there's been fairly recent activity. I'd yeah. On the SDKs. Yeah, but the problem is we don't know what that activity means unless you actually look at what's in there. Right? For example, I, I'm, I'd be surprised if many of them support multiple versions of cloud events at the same time, the way you guys have done on the Go SDK. And if we want to do interop across versions, then we need to get people to sign up to make probably rather. Right. Uh, so, so maybe if we can get uh, some of the authors online uh, for the next meeting of this, yeah, we can talk with, talk through uh, differences. Yeah, I'll try to send out a nagging note for people to show up the next time. Is it? I can't remember. Is it next week or two weeks? Two, two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. Okay. Okay. I'll try to get you ready to join in two weeks. Uh, also, I'll be on for the the first part of the cloud events call, but I need to bail for a, for a session. Okay. Sounds good. So you've heard my voice. I have heard your voice and I got you on there already. Actually, ooh, let me start sharing my screen. I forgot. Do, do, do. Bonjour. Hello. Hello, hello. Oh, no. Do you really mean to claim, Doug, that you don't have time to go over the world and knock on everybody's doors and ask them the questions about SDK? <laughs> I'd like to. I could use some more frequent flyer miles. <laughs> uh, this, this year, so far, I've only done gone on one trip, so I'm not planning on keeping my status, unfortunately. <sighs> I mean, there's bigger problems usually in life than keeping your frequent flyer status, though. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. I heard Clemens. Sandeep, are you there? Cindy? Hi, guys. Hello. Yes. All right, I got hey. you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Eric, are you there? I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Matthias? I'm here. Hello. Hello. Oh. Uh, okay, I think that's everybody so far. So now I get to get organized. And no, Scott, I have not eaten lunch yet. So you've been warned. Oh, Doug Davis, punchy. <laughs> yes, very, very punchy. But I'd be a lot punchier if I was in your situation, having my laptop stolen. That's just, that's going to disturb me all day now. Well, the, the silver lining is that now the new one is faster. There you go. Okay. Way to look on the bright side. Uh, Mr. Berker. Hey, I'm here. Hello. Hi, Adam. Good morning. Hello. You guys are way early today. Yeah, I started recording as soon as I shut up, so I left. <laughs> uh, Somebody just joined. I know you're not. So Clemens, you mentioned through Slack that you did not get a chance to do anything except update the the data content type PR. Um, have you given any thought though to the 
issue that Adam opened up about the quotes and the headers. I was wondering if you wanted to talk uh, about that one at all. I, I um, well, the, except for the discussion that we already had, I have not given it further thought because I just didn't have any time time this week. I've been, okay. I've been here and uh, my days then end up being randomized and full. Okay, that's fine. I just was wondering whether I should put on the agenda or not, so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He, here is weird to say on a call, but like, yeah, it's in Seattle. Yeah, I figured that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, David, are you there? Yeah, sorry, good, good morning, Doc, how are you? Good morning, good, and Ginger. Ginger, are you there? Okay, we'll circle back around with Ginger. I am, sorry. Oh, there I'm you are. Too hard I, to find the unmute button this morning. <laughs> I've been there, I hear you. All right. Do, 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 do. Good morning. Hey, was that Colin? Yep. Yep, excellent. Got it. Thank you. And Christoph, are you there? Yeah, hi. I yeah. probably have to leave early today. Oh, well, then we'll jump on your issues first then. Uh, Jim, are you there? Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, Mr. Doug, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yep, I got you. Thank you. <clears throat> Roberto, are you there? Yes, good morning. Good morning. William, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Hello. And Tam, are you there? Tam? Hi, yes, I'm here. Oh, excellent. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Kathy. Kathy, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, hello. Hey, it's been a while. I think that's, is that Vladimir who just joined? That's right. I joined. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And Jem is also connecting. We have some network issues. Okay, not, not a problem. Thank you. Oops. If I have a minute or so, then we'll get started. Um, who is, there's a really funky ID popping up in Zoom. It starts with H-I-A-U-F. Who is that? Okay, you want to stay silent. Hey, Jim. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, someone named M. Chuburka just joined. Are you there? Okay, we'll circle back around later. All right, let's go and get started, three after the hour. Um, so in terms of uh, action items, I think the only one that's really kind of more nag worthy, put it that way, is this one for Clemens, which we already kind of poked him on. So Clemens, when you get a chance, that wouldn't be good. 
There's lots yes. of anxious people out there for that one. Yeah, 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 I know. Yep, thank you. It's, it's um, always me. It's always me in the homework. I know. I know. I know. You're such a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. SDK subgroup. Um, we actually had a meeting right before this one. We actually didn't talk about it really very much related to SDKs. Um, other than actually, Scott, do you want to talk about some of the cool features you just added, just to put pressure on everybody else? Yeah. So um, I've been working with adding open census to the Golang SDK. So it doesn't expose metrics, but it collects them. And then it, it gives you a way to um, set up an exporter in whatever happen, you happen to be running. Uh, so I have, I've, I've been adding a little example that exposes using Prometheus and then it shows traces uh, using the log to console noise. But um, it, you choose correct uh, exporters and then uh, you can start collecting traces and metrics using the SDK. And because of uh, how I use context is you can actually trace all the way through your application and the SDK and it'll sh it should show up in the uh, audit collector as one, one trace. One Very metric. cool. Uh, Jim, you had your hand up? Yeah, so just a quick question on that. I'm, we're uh, slightly off topic from cloud events, I guess, but we're going through an internal discussion around open sensors ver versus open tracing. Um, open tracing is backed by CNCF, isn't it? So I'm, I'm curious of the, um, and I, I'm not criticizing, I'm just I'm trying to understand whether as a CNCF project, we're meant to be more aligned with other CNCF projects. As far as I understand it, Open Census allows you to export to Open Tracing. Okay. So it, Open Census is more of a generic collect the data and then uh, you give it exporters that export. So Prometheus and um, I, I, you should look at the list. There's like eight or nine that are that come default and then you have the ability to add your own. Yeah, sure. Maybe, maybe I'll follow up with you offline, just so um, so we're not hogging this conversation. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, but just to, to focus on your question there, Jim, um, and this is strictly my opinion, um, my, my interpretation of the CNCF projects were, yeah, it'd be nice if, if they, if other CNCF projects use the existing CNCF projects, but it, it's definitely not a hard requirement or anything like that. Each project needs, should use whatever it thinks is best to get its job done, um, is, is sort of been my approach. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, um, moving forward then. Uh, demo work. Uh, Doug and Scott, do you guys want to talk about where we are? I guess maybe more Doug since you've kind of been taking the lead on the, the airport scenario. You want to talk about where we are on that one? Doug, are you able to come off mute? There we go. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we, we got you now. Go ahead. Uh, too many mute buttons. Yeah. Uh, well, we had a, um, a lengthy conversation, I guess, uh, last Monday, or yeah, a few days ago, four days ago, Monday. Um, and uh, the original um, airport um, demo proposal um, involved uh, um, uh, issuing tasks to attendees within uh, a few different roles, the role of passenger and uh, a driver, you know, the things that were involved in a, in a supply chain uh, scenario. Um, and then when Clemens participated in that call, uh, we started to steer the demo more uh, towards notifications rather than tasks so that the, uh, the processes that would be handled by microservices in that uh, in the orchestration of all those events related to um, ordering and order fulfillment would be more automatic, you know, handled by robots. And so the uh, attendees would be connecting into the various cloud nodes that uh, really represented those systems that were involved in that process. And they would be getting notifications based upon just the you know a traditional pub sub model. So um, so the uh, demo deck has been revised to reflect notifications instead of tasks, and 
um, Clemens wanted to review that and, and uh, we're waiting, I think, for that review. All right. Um, Clemens or Scott, anybody want to add something who's been on those calls? Um, yeah, we have the, we have the, the discussion that we had was um, that I've been making that objection a few times in, in a few demo scenarios where we had this, um, this conflict between what messaging really does, where you would use a queuing system where you effectively assign task and then um, parties take the task of a queue, but there can only be one party that can reasonably execute that task. And then also goes and provides feedback. That's the kind of correlated communication path that we scoped out of cloud events. Um, and so, and, but those always exist in these kinds of scenarios. So I pointed that out. So, but there's in that scenario, there's plenty of paths where uh, what we've do, done so far in cloud events uh, actually fits the bill well. So that was the that was the the um, the main feedback, and so we're kind of restructuring so that we can go in and show, uh, you know, appropriate use of cloud events of reporting out facts and then reacting to them, building building extensibility based on that. Um, and then have kind of the core, the core flow of the workflow, really be be a workflow that's, that's more traditional, um, uh, you know, a messaging substrate under, under the covers. Right. All right. Any questions or comments? Okay, so just to let you guys know, um, I just now sent out a reschedule notice from this Monday's meeting to the next Monday. Um, so I forgot to set it up so we could talk again on Monday. I'm assuming um, you, uh, Clemens, you'll have a chance to, to look it over and do whatever edits you were thinking about making by, by then? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I've just been, uh, today's my travel day, which means I'm gonna be able to go and get something done today and tomorrow too. So yes, I'll be able to do something. Okay, cool, thank you. All right, uh, Scott, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, that's, that was pretty much it. Okay, cool. All right, in that case, moving forward, um, KubeCon EU. I did get confirmation, I think it was either yesterday or the day before, that we got our two 35-minute sessions for cloud events, intro and deep dive, <clears throat> and then one large 85-minute session for the serverless workgroup itself. Um, I still don't know quite what's going on with the serverless practitioners summit. Um, I need to go back and ping Chris and check on that. So it is possible that our serverless session gets moved into that or make it separate, don't know. Um, but I think as far as I know, they are still planning on having this co-located summit. We just don't know what's going on with it yet. So I'll keep you guys abreast of that if I find out anything. Of course, if you guys hear anything, please speak up. I, I did hear that uh, there's gonna be an announcement on Monday. Oh, cool, okay, excellent. And uh, as far as I know, it's still being planned and it's being planned for day zero of that Monday. Yep, okay, excellent. Thank you, Scott. Uh, KubeCon China, nothing new there other than I did put in there a request for the, basically the same three different sessions that I did for EU. I'll let you know when that happens. All right, so let's jump into PRs. I don't see Rachel on the call. However, do, 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 I know she did update her PR based upon the vote that we had two or three weeks ago. I can't remember how long ago it was. So let's take a look at what she did here. So basically, what she did was based upon the vote, she added a section in the primer that talks about proprietary protocols and what we're doing with them in terms of additional specs. And then she created a placeholder document to point to those specifications that live outside of our repo. But the key thing is probably this section right here, talking about the, the text itself. I'll leave you guys a second to read that since I'm sure probably some people haven't had a chance to read it yet. Good okay. to me. Yeah, it okay. looks good to me as well. Yeah, obviously it's in the primer, so it's not normative anyway, but I think it pretty much lays out what we agreed to, which is we hold no responsibility, but we're gonna point to it for easy, easy reference and easy finding. Anybody have any questions or concerns with this direction? Does anybody feel like um, they need more time to think about it or 
If if not, I'll I'll call for a vote. There's a typo in the proprietary spec should follow the same format at the at other specs. As what, line the other. What, what line number? Uh, 319. 319. It should say the format as the other specs. Ah, okay. I will make a note of that. Hold on. Line 319. Okay, thank you. I can make that change or talk to Rachel about it. Okay, anything and else? Yeah, and the other and the words are the wrong way around. So you should oh. say the other. Wait a minute, say that again. Provider text packs should follow the same format as, oh, the other. Got it. Okay. Okay. I'll get that fixed. Okay. Anything else on this one? Anybody want more time to review it? Okay. Any objection to adopting it with the wording fixed that was just ever addressed or brought up? Okay. So with typo fixed. Oops. Okay. Thank you guys. Christoph, uh, which one of these is ready for us to talk about if either of them? Which one do you want to talk about? Well, basically. So what we settled on was we want to have a minimum event size that is supported by all consumers of cloud events. And now I prepare two options. Um, the first one is open since a bit longer. So that's basically just says uh, the cloud events uh, or the cloud event as in JSON, in the JSON format must not be larger than 64 kilobyte. And then you have a or everybody has to accept the cloud event that in JSON is 64 kilobyte. So the problem with that is if you have a different format, uh, then you don't really know. So if I'm sending it over MQTT or MQP or protobuf or whatever, um, I don't really know what the event of uh, the size of the JSON will be. So I would have to uh, take my uh, cloud event out of the one format and then encode it in JSON to know if I'm compliant or not. Um, personally, I don't think it's always a big issue if you know your event is small enough. So if your uh, thing is like 10, 20 kilobytes, you know in JSON you won't uh, uh, go beyond 64 kilobytes. Uh, but I was criticized, so I made the second PR, <clears throat> which is then independent of JSON, and it tries to describe the size of the event independently, um, well, of any encoding. Uh, so it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, but then, on the other hand, it is, uh, how would I say this? It's but eas more easily applicable and maybe it's easier to measure. So also for a, a producer, you can more easily check that you're compliant with it and maybe you only, so basically there are a lot of rules for the context attributes, but I think most people will automatically follow them. So you can sort of ignore them. And then the only thing you have to look at is the data attribute. So I think in practice, it may be easier for uh, some. So these are the two options that I laid out. Uh, Clemens and others made a comment that they think it's also okay to just say, uh, here's 64 kilobytes and whatever format you use, just make sure to stay under 64 kilobytes and that will leave some gray zone, but we're fine with it. Um, my response to this is that <laughs> I'm not fine with that. Um, so I come from a commerce background, so, so my customers would use those events to maybe uh, charge a credit card or uh, ship a package or whatever. And I cannot go and tell them there's a gray zone, and if your event happens to be in that gray zone, I won't deliver this event to you. Uh, that's just something that doesn't fly. So for me, I, I want to have really a guarantee where I can say um, I'm sending out this event and then I know that every compliant consumer will forward this event, whatever you put in between. So this is what these two uh, pull requests try to achieve in two different ways. Okay, thank you for the summary. All right, so we need to open the floor for discussion. Who wants to voice an opinion? Oh, come on. 
my my observation that I made was that with current messaging infrastructure, even with multi-protocol brokers, so if you look at, you know, I'll p pick an example and say ActiveMQ, that can also also cite Service Bus or or even Event Hubs. Um, what you'll find is that um, so those the latter two being ours. Uh, we have a limit, and that limit is is total message size, and it applies to whichever protocol you come you can you come in with. And um, uh, so, like for service buses, one megabyte, and whether you come in for HTTP and whether you come in through a, through AMQP, that's the frame size we support. And whatever stuff you put in there, including all the properties and all the payloads, needs to fit needs to fit with that. And if you have, if you have, an, you know, if you combine, if you want to combine a route with an active MQ broker, and you put a pump in the middle, well, then you make sure that you, uh, um, you know, that your the messages can't exceed one megabyte. And it, ultimately, I think it's about it's the the party who goes and configures the overall system, who needs to make sure that that all fits together. Um, but I'm not sure we can really go like I, I don't know how this section really helps. In um, you know, in staying under a, a, or above uh, a limit, because ultimately, when you make this normative, then you're forcing every intermediary to go and, and do all the byte counting, um, and uh, that's costing perf. Because we're actually so in our infrastructure, we're forwarding cloud events and and we're parsing out stuff that we need for routing, but we're not policing we're not policing individual quotas, and probably wouldn't because that's just costing us. Uh, um, too much work at scale, and so I'm. I, I, I don't see us. I don't see us enforcing those rules. Can I respond to it? Yeah, please. Uh, so it is not a rule th that you have to check these. The only thing that you have, if um, if you look at the last sentence uh, or the the second last sentence. Cloud events consumers may reject events that do not follow these rules, but no one forces you uh, to reject them, right? So you can still go and say, my limit is one megabyte uh, for whatever you send in. I just accept one megabyte and that's good for me. And you're yeah. compliant with that. Well, but see, I'm building generic infrastructure. And so um, because I'm building generic infrastructure, I need to go and provide a switch that then goes and forces the rules and to be pro completely protocol compliant. And so I'm, I'm, I don't know. So I don't know how this feature, which, because I see this, if I see this as a feature request on my, on my infrastructure, how that actually helps because the, the ultimately it's about the, the event fitting into the frame size, because that's what the protocol gives me, right? There's a, there's an HTTP gateway, and that gate, HTTP gateway has four buffered events, a certain size limit, and there's an HTTP, there's an MQP frame size that I can't go over, and that's ultimately what governs um, the threshold for how, for what messages I can I can I can support, and all of that math here is not going to help me to um, to you know truly enforce this. What what matters is that you when you show up as a publisher. And the and I constrain the frame size on the MQP frames to 64k. You need to stay under 64k. So, Jim, you have your hand up. Yeah. I, so, I, I guess I would sort of come into the same conclusion that Christoph mentioned. That I I sort of see this more as a compliance proof than a runtime constraint. So as an infrastructure provider you could run some compliance tests that ensured that events constructed to to this spec actually flowed and i think that's all we were trying to get to from this spec it was trying to say as a as a source of an of an event which is then going to travel across potentially multiple people's uh, infrastructures over a number of intermediaries to get to some endpoint it should, to Christoph's point, it should be able to leave one place and arrive at the other in, in the same state and not be rejected along the way. So it, it is more of a, uh, an intermediary compliance statement, I think. All right. Anybody else like to speak up?
Okay. I'm not sure how to interpret the silence um, because it could mean no one cares at all except for the people that spoke up or it could mean you guys are perfectly okay with <laughs> the silence and acceptance. Yeah, that is one way to view it. I was getting that. Um, and I'm, so I'm trying to figure out how to move forward on here because I mean, ultimately, if we don't move from our current position, it, it, I think the only choice is just, okay, put up a vote. Um, and we could definitely do that if that's the next step. I was hoping to get a little bit more back and forth from people to see how they feel about this. So, um, so since no one's raising their hand, and Jim, your hand is still up, by the way. Um, uh, Christoph, let me ask you this question. If we were to go forward with a vote, would you want to put both PRs into the vote, or would you like to choose just one? Well, I I don't have a strong preference either way, to be honest. For me, what really matters is that I have this guarantee that uh, some sort of size will be accepted by everyone, and I don't really care too much how that is being made up. Um, yeah, so I don't have a strong preference. So okay. the person's commented they prefer number two, so then that's okay. Yeah. Me. The reason I'm asking is because I know last time we had a vote, we had, I think, three or four different choices in front of us. And we did the, that voting style that starts with a C. And I can't remember, never remember the name. But I think it's always easier when people are faced with two choices. And unfortunately, right now, I see four choices in front of us. I see your two choices. A third choice is do nothing at all, leave the spec as is. And then the fourth choice is the one that you mentioned that Clements mentioned, which is just say what the max size is on the wire and 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 you don't try to get fancy about it. It's just whatever protocol you're using, you got to stay under 40, 64K or whatever it is. So I think I heard four different choices out there. Um, and I'd like to see if we can try to narrow down the choices if possible so we get to more of a Boolean choice. Um, so let me ask this question. Uh, Clemens, if, if Christoph's memory is correct and you had mentioned this option of just saying 64K regardless of protocol or binding, is that, a, is that a concrete proposal that you'd like to put forward or was that just a, a thought that you had at one point in time? So yeah, I would, I would propose, I would want to propose that. Basically, as I commented, like the last comment I made on, on this PR, um, uh, not, m not much wordier than this. It's like, you know, should be, I, I don't know exactly what I wrote, but that's, for me, that's the, the actual alternative. I, I would like to have a limit but I would I wouldn't would like to have a limit that is just really as simple as frame size on wire. Okay. So but again, ask... it's not a limit; it's a minimum supported size. So that's the real difference. Like if you're proposing a limit, that is something else. Well, that's what I meant. So minimum, 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 minimum supported size. That's what I meant. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let me ask this question. <clears throat> is there anybody who thinks that we should do nothing at all? Okay, well, since no one spoke up, I'm gonna take that as everybody on the call thinks we need to say at least something in this space, which means we can eliminate the do nothing choice. Is that a fair conclusion based upon the silence? Speak now if you, if you don't feel that way. Okay. So we're down to three, so that's good. <laughs> so, um, so between Christoph, between year two, as you said, or as you pointed out, some people in the chat are saying they preferred number two as well. Would you feel comfortable with just choosing between your number two and the Clemens proposal that I'm hoping he would write up at some point, or would you want to keep your number one in there as an alternative? No, we can take my number two. Okay. So, what I'm, what I, so I think what I'm hearing is if we can, if anybody objects to this, the thought process here that I was walking through is once Clemens writes up his, his proposal, people can, people can then choose between this number two that's on the screen right here from Christoph and Clemens' proposal, which is just 64K minimum size regardless of protocol. Is that what we're going towards? I believe yeah, that's I true. Think, I think so, Doug. Okay, I just want to make sure. 
Like I, I don't want to, I don't want feel, people to feel like I'm forcing a decision down their throats by excluding something. So if that's true, then Clemens, do you think um, you'll be able to put something together uh, to, for people to look at? Yeah, that is so easy that I will probably get this done today or tomorrow. Okay. Um, in that case, um, I'm trying to think about the, our process. I don't think, I think formal votes technically have to go for a week. Um, I don't think we've ever really started a vote before that didn't start and end during a phone call. So I'm a little bit nervous about starting one, you know, like say today or tomorrow. Um, unless you guys feel like that's okay, I'd almost rather wait until next week. So Clemens, you can do a little talking to your proposal and then start the vote next week. Uh, is that okay with people? Or do you guys feel like, no, we need to get this resolved immediately and we should start the vote sooner rather than later? Okay, I'm not hearing any objections. So, Clemens, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just saying it sounds good. Okay, okay, so Clemens, you have a little bit more time then. If you can just make sure your, your PR is ready in time for next week. Um, yes, sir. We, yeah, we can kick off the vote. Um, I mean, um, to be honest though, if, if you guys offline start LGTMing one of them like completely and the other one gets no comments at all, that may mean we take a voice, voice vote uh, during the call because no one's really speaking in favor of the other one. So think about doing some offline discussions if you can. But worst case scenario, we'll start the vote next Thursday and then they'll run for one week. Sound fair? Yeah, will do. Okay, cool. Thank you guys, I appreciate that. Um, I'll make some notes in the meeting minutes about that. Um, Christoph, did, is this one ready to be discussed? I can't remember, uh, I thought maybe. No, I wanted to make uh, it in uh, extension, but I didn't oh. have time yet. Okay, that's what I thought, okay. Um, all right, this one. <clears throat> I don't think Alan is on the call, unfortunately, but I wanted to bring this one up because I can't remember for sure <laughs> my memory's going, whether we actually discussed this one or not, or where we, if we did discuss it, where we landed. Um, so basically, Alan is proposing that we uniquely identify events based upon uh, source and ID put together. Um, and I know that there's been a little bit of discussion about possibly pulling in type as the third part of that tuple. Um, but I wanted to get a sense from the group um, as to which way you guys want to go with this. Because I've, I've heard some people say, we can't do anything at all here, and it's silly to even try. And then I've heard other people say, no, we need to at least do something here so people can do deduping or, or something in this space. Um, but I want to get a general sense which way you guys want to go as a group. So let me open the floor up for discussion. I, again, I'll, I'll just say, I think we need some statement around this. Otherwise, everyone will go off and do their own thing. And when you say do their own thing, can you elaborate a little on what you think they're, they, what exactly is the problem they need to solve that this will address? So I'm assuming the drive here is to enable idempotent message pro or event processing. Yeah. Um, so if we don't, make a statement as to what we think an idempotent key is, then every publisher consumer pair will come up with their own way of doing it. Okay, thank you. Does everybody agree that that is the problem we're trying to solve? Yes. Okay. Does anybody think this is a problem that we should not be solving? What I'm trying to do is eliminate the do nothing choice. Does anybody think we should do nothing? Okay, because I could have sworn I heard somebody say that in the past. So, okay. So, not hearing any objection, we're going to do something. So then I think the question then comes down to something like ID and source or ID source and type. Because I think at least one person in the chat said they, they think type should be included. And I just think, Scott, you're in that camp as well. Yes, so, I am. Okay, would you like to speak to why you think type needs to be included? If, uh, I, I, well, okay, so let's say uh, the example of there is a, uh, an entity that takes an in an event and then it produces two new events of two different types, but it wants to reuse the ID. 
like a like an event split. I I could see that as a useful apparatus. Okay. Anybody want to speak to that? Christoph, your hands up. Yeah, I have a slightly different argumentation why I think including type is a good idea. <clears throat> so currently in the spec, we well, it's only should well we say the type should uh, contain a reverse DNS uh, in front of the <clears throat> type name. So I think this is the only place where we really ask for this uh, sort of internet internet unique URI thing. On the source, it's sort of optional. You can do it. You don't have to do it. And <clears throat> if if we now make it only source and ID, then we're effectively doubling the uh, URN twice. Because then, if you want to have the duplication properly, then you have to include your URL basically both in the event type and in the source. And I think that's a bit unfortunate. Um, I mean, you can still do it. Uh, if you want to, but it's not necessarily a good thing because I've, right now the source to me feels like it's not necessarily a real URL that you can actually call. It could be just something you made up. So in terms of send source, it could be just a, uh, <clears throat> well, a description of your sensor, but it, this IoT device doesn't really have an URL that you can call. But, but we've, we've explicitly excluded that. Like this, there should, there should actually not be a callable thing in that entire event. Yeah, exactly. But then, but if you sort of say it's the source and ID and those uh, make the deduplication, then you more or less force people to put the URL into the, or the top the uh, DNS part into the source. And because that's the only way you can make sure that it's actually internet uh, unique. And yeah. then you end up uh, with something that looks like you should be able to call it. So, so we have so the the the, the uniqueness the uniqueness uh, uh, requirement that we're talking about here is how can we uniquely identify this particular event in, event instance, and since we can't since the ID shouldn't always have to be a GUID, uh, but should be able to to be a little bit more compact. You basically need to have a rel have a have a, a reference to uh, you know where where's that ID space coming from. And you qualify that ID space with with a URI, but that URI is yet is yet so that, that that identifies the source. But that doesn't have to be anything that's that's callable. It's just something where you uh, assure in some way to uh, make that thing that thing unique. And there's rules in how you can go and 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 create a URI. For instance, using your domain name that you that is assigned to you. Um, either as a URN or as a as a um, as a URI with some scheme uh, that then scopes to you, but that's the same thing as you would do for let's say uh, in an XML uh, namespace declaration or a namespace declaration elsewhere. That doesn't need to be a callable thing. It's just a URI that is reasonably that can be reasonably assumed to be unique to your to your source. Yeah, I'm not disputing that. I'm saying we already have. We, we do that once and we do it for the type. That's where the spec currently says, please use your URN, reverse it, and then put it there so that your type is hopefully internet unique because no one will steal your domain. Yeah, but that's, um, th th but that's a different thing, right? The, the, the type is something that classifies, that effectively refers to, implicitly refers to the schema of the event that you're about to process. So that is like the uh, whatever, raise alarm uh, type, right? And that's th that raise alarm type by a device from device maker X might be applicable to many kinds of devices and many types of devices. And it's just a uniform way of how you express alerts. And that impl Im implicitly refers to a schema and probably even more explicitly than further down in the event refers to a schema URL. But that is, that is distinct from the actual concrete instance of a device that raises the event, which is the source ID, which then has an ID, score, ID uh, space, effectively a unique identifier space that it, it emits because it has an internal counter um, that it then stamps the, those events with. 
So the event, the event ID is relative to the concrete instance of um, the, 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 the source URI, so the, the concrete instance of device. But I, f I see that as completely orthogonal to the event type. Okay, so, so my hand's up and I'm asking these questions as, as Doug, not as moderator. Um, <clears throat> so Scott, the, the, the sample you gave of doing event splitting, it seems to me that what you're really doing there is overloading ID to be almost like a correlation ID at that point. Because if you're taking the event and splitting it, I would almost expect you to create two new IDs at that point. Um, because let, me, I, let me take my example back. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so going to something we were talking, Doug and I were talking about um, uh, in the Knative project, we have these things called sources and they, they, we make the choice that we um, uh, use uh, the Knative no name in the, in the type. But uh, let's say you have two applications that are bridging non-cloud of cloud event uh, webhooks into cloud event webhooks. And there's two versions of that thing that both like, like pull, an, a, pull, a pull request from GitHub, they act on the webhook. The, the webhook has the cloud event ID that you can pull out of the body, because that's a known thing. The source is the resource that GitHub is talking about. And the only way you can dedupe the two events that come in is if you understand the type of the, the application that did the bridging. So one would be Joe's adapter dot pull request and the other one would be Mike's adapter dot pull request. So, so, <laughs> this is a very dangerous conversation because this is going to get into should type be from the original event producer versus this adapter that you're talking about and not, I didn't want to go there quite yet but I, I guess the, the way I kind of look at this is in the spec we already say ID needs to be unique within the scope of the producer and to me, the the spec version of quote scope of the producer is basically source. That's the only thing we have that, that comes close to fitting that bill. So that's why to me, ID and source pretty much need to be unique. Because um, I don't know what it means as a receiver of an event. If I get two events with the exact same source and ID, but different types, I, I, I don't know how to, I would not honestly know how to interpret that. I would almost look at it as one of them was a mistake. Um, so that's why I get a little confused when, when, we, when the spec goes out of its way to say ID must be unique. Well, then what does that mean anymore, right? If, if we can't guarantee its uniqueness it, and we have to count on something else, it, it seems like it's a, it just feels a little weird that, that we're saying ID is unique, but not really, right? So anyway, that, that's kind of where I'm looking at it. Um, Tapini, your hands up. Yeah, the, just to bring back your example that you pulled back, um, there, I would think there's a valid case for uh, event splitting if you have, let's say, pull request version one and pull request version two, or pull request created version one and version two. Would you then also need to have different IDs? Because an example of an ID there is, for example, a database commit ID. And if you had two versions of an event for database row created, I would expect them to have the same ID then. I think the event has a different ID and the, the source points to a unique, that unique resource and the source would be the same in those two events. So uh, yeah, the, source, the source would be the same, the type would be different, but would the ID be different? Yeah. If yes, then that's a bad example of a, event ID, the database comic ID there. Yeah, the, the, the ID identifies the event per se, right? It's for, dedu it's, it's, it's for deduplication. It's for handling in the infrastructure. I don't think it necessarily is. So I, I think if you have a database commit and you want to raise uh, um, uh, information about the database commit, then you might want to go and, and raise that about that database commit, which means that might be in the source. This actually goes back to this the discussion of uh, that we had many months ago between the the source and the subject, because that's actually the thing we're missing. I think it is. I have subscribed to a source, but that that source has kind of 
sub elements that it raises uh, events about and we don't have a good way to to express the about in the in the structure that we have like collapsing it everything into the source which we did based on that discussion um is causing that so the way how we how we in 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 event grid represent this where we have kind of the the source you subscribe to and then you have further information uh, that is in the in the source at uri is we use the the pound anchor and then put all the further information on the right side of that but it, we attach it to the source of your eye so your database transaction id would actually be part of the source so evan is asking a good question i think it's relevant here right if there is one occurrence but two events are generated from that one occurrence and the example he gave was there's a something happened in the database and that created a create and a write event from that do they both have do both of those cloud events that get generated have the same id I would argue no. I think they have the same they have the same cause, and that's that's expressed in the currently we have things that's collapsed into source, um, but the events are distinct because they're also distinct types. Yeah, that that's where I tend to land as well. It's there are two separate events. One was a create once a write, but they're related to the same event. I'm sorry, the same occurrence, but they're two separate events. That's where my head is at as well. But Scott, I'd, I'd be curious to know your take on that. I would agree. I think those are two different IDs. I think this really comes down to when it's uh, two different producers producing events based on some other uh, non-cloud event event that's happened that can have an ID associated to that. Like two entities watching the database write and they're both emitting events for that source. You can't dedupe that if you don't know the type. But in that case, isn't whatever the thing is that's emitting that event is the source? Isn't that the, the, what we're really saying? Uh, and, and when you do that, the source and the ID become a unique pair, a distinct pair. I believe that's true. Well, that's assuming you don't use the, um, so the database transaction has an ID and the emitter could take that ID from the transaction and use that as the cloud event ID. And that either needs to be explicitly disallowed by the specification for cloud events or the, it needs to be a tuple that includes type. But, but that emitter is a proxy for the database, isn't it? So that, that transaction ID is only ever going to occur once. Yeah? Right, um, but there are two things that are listening to that transaction. Okay. So they would listen to the event, yeah? No, they listen to the database directly. And they would you expect those two things to identify themselves using an equivalent source? I would expect them to have exactly the same source and ID, but different type. See, I guess I always kind of assumed that event ID was almost like cloud event specific. And, um... Yeah, I, I think so too. The, so I think this, so, so let me, let me try to really, I think, I think I'm happy about this discussion happening because it actually points to, I strongly believe still that this points to the fact that we have a missing field. Um, and that is subject. Because, because the, the source, as we, generally, as, as we generally understand it, is equivalent largely to, and sorry if I have to say that word again, to what we call topic in, in, uh, in PubSub. And that is, it is the scope at which you subscribe, right? You, you register interest in a particular source that is emitting events to you. At that level, you, 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 you make a subscription. And then you're interested in events of different types. And each of those events, you need to be able to, to, to tell apart. And you do that with the ID. And the, but the ID is basically just a discriminator and you shouldn't have to go and interpret that in, in any particular way, but it really just acts as a key. But the, the, the missing information field that we have, I, I believe, is this effectively the sub-element um, inside of the source 
that this event is in particular about. So I'll give you the, I'll, I'll go back to the, the initial example that I talked about when we, when we were discussing this um, about the blob storage, right? You subscribe to a storage container. You don't know which files are going to be created yet, but you know that you are interested in, in files that are being, that will be created, deleted, et cetera, in that, in that container. That is your source. And then a file gets created and you get that raised out of that container, which means that is your source. You had a blob created event, that is your event, that is your event type. And then you have an ID, which is an artificial identifier, which, which, which distinguishes that from another blob created event. And then you still need to have a field that says, this is the name of that file. This, is, this, is, this, this, this sets this apart you know, from other events that call blob created because you need to be able to, to, to separate those two. And what we currently do, because we don't have that field in, in our implementation, is we put a, this pound separator behind the source URI so we can separate out, out the original source URI and this extra information um, in some way. And I think that's a missing field. And I've, been, I've been, been saying that as we in the beginning, and then we decided to co consolidate initially what we had four fields into one field and that was the source. And I think, still think that's a mistake. I still think we need to have an extra subject field. So I, I I understand your reasoning there. I in that scenario, wouldn't that file name or whatever you call it actually be an attribute of the event itself? Uh, what I'm saying. Well, how because, do you just, because to your point, the event was emitted by the container, not by the not by the file. So the con, the the source is the container. The idea is the discriminator for that event within that container but then the file name is actually an attribute of the event schema i, I would argue um yeah so the reason the reason why i still like there's a practical reason for why i still would like to have that extra field and it's filtering when because you will you will um if you watch for certain cloud events being emitted from that container and you're really only interested in whatever JPEG files, it, it, instead of, of having to know that particular schema of, a, um, you know, of the block created event, you will want to have a field in the, um, in the metadata that you can go and apply a suffix filter on for, you know, I want to see all the events of the following type where the subject field has the following suffix, and that is .jpg. And then if that's true, then I can go and dispatch the event, and otherwise I won't. And so that gives you a generic way, a generic filtering capability um, that's cheap um, without uh, having to dig into this, uh, the event itself and opening up the data and parsing it and uh, et cetera. So like you have one discriminator that gives you effectively a subscope that you can go and, and execute cheap filter expressions uh, on for routing and for for selecting what the subscriber really wants. And that's what we need. That's what we use that that pound sign um, uh, extra thing for. So, uh, sorry, sorry. Wait, I, I was on mute. Sorry. Let me, let me go to the speaker queue because I know Scott, you raised your hand and my hand was up there too. But let me let me just say one thing. Evan, thank you for pointing that that line out the uh, database commit ID possibly being an, the ID that kind of got me wondering whether whether we need to be a little more crisp on what this ID actually is because to be honest I'm actually thinking database commit ID actually is not an appropriate thing to use there because I would think that this field would actually be inside the data someplace because that's application specific data and while I'm not saying you we need to ban this kind of use here I, I, I think I tend to think of the ID as me as more of just something unique to distinguish this event from other events, not something semantic specific to the application. It's more just I'm 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 just spitting out a stream of events, and I need to say this is one, this is number one, this is number two, this is number three, and you're not going to get the same number more than once. It has no correlation to the actual data being processed, and by using things like commit ID, you're actually overloading the semantic meaning of this field to no longer just being something that you can use for dedupe purposes, but now you're actually putting additional meaning behind it. Like for example, in Scott's use case, doing some sort of correlation ID between you know, the events that he's doing splitting on. And I'm not comfortable with that kind of 
overloading of semantics. I'd rather have a very clear single definition and single pur purpose for any particular uh, field we have in here. But that's just my take on it. So Scott, I think your hand was up next. Yeah, a huge plus to what uh, Clemens was just talking about. We, we're running into that, to that same problem with Knative where we would really like to be able to filter on certain things like the bucket, but not necessarily the UUID of the blob that's inside that bucket. And right now, there's just no good way to take take a look at source and be able to split it in half unless you do something very special, like uh, Clemens was saying that, that they're doing. Like you can't do that as middleware. So if you want to have middleware that does filtering based on uh, the the so service of the source, not the, the uh, entity of the source, the, it's very difficult. Okay, so we're running a little low on time. I don't think we're gonna necessarily resolve this one here. Um, so a couple things here. First, there are a lot of really good comments made uh, in the chat and, and on voice about this issue. Please put your comment to the PR so we can continue the discussion offline. But to Clemens, it sounds like you wanna open up a either issue or pull request to add another field. Can you get that one out there to, to the, is kind of related to this discussion? Yeah, so I'll, what I'll do is since we have so much material on this, uh, in the uh, uh, already in the, the repo, um, I'm going to open up a new. I'm going to open up a new PR, and then I'm going to point to all of this. And we have actually the the deck. So in the in the um, in the repo, there is a section where we have a few powerpoints, mm -hmm. and there's one uh, that talks about topics and um, and some. Comments? Do we lose you? I think you want to mute, Collins. Um, so th there's there's a in the in the re in the repo there's a PowerPoint deck somewhere. If you could go and and show that to all of us. Um, in sh I think share. And it's the topics and subject one. That thing is actually fairly fairly um, uh, deep and it has a nar has a narration. So I talked to that thing. So if you open that and if you are in possession of Microsoft PowerPoint, thank you very much. And uh, then you can actually go and, and put that into presentation mode and you can hear me speak to that, top, uh, to that topic where I make a very passionate argument for why we should have two fields. So, so if uh, anybody has uh, uh, time and interest, you can go and look at it and in, in uh, parallel. I will make a PR and basically pro propose the subject field. Yeah, Dan, here's the video and the PowerPoint. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So please put comments on there. Um, before we go back and just do final roll call, um, there are a couple of PRs here that I think are actually ready for discussion. I have one on what is optional. And Jem opened up one. I think, Jem, there are a couple of minor typo or syntactical things uh, I made comments on. But I'd like to get people's opinions on whether they're okay with that general direction. Um, so please look at that and uh, comment in the PR itself. Um, I think, it's, I think it's pretty much ready to go. We just need people to look at it and say yes or no to it. And with that, let me go back and do final roll call. Um, Klaus, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Um, whoops, God, I keep doing that. Mehmet, are you there? Mehmet from Verizon? Okay, Mr. Tarkowski? I'm here. Okay, Evan, are you there? I was mute, this is Mehmet, so I'm here. Excellent, thank you. Okay, Evan, are you there still? Yes, okay. I'm here. Okay, and M, oh, he's not on the phone anymore, or whoever that was. Is there anybody I missed on the roll call? Christian here, hello. Christian, got it, okay, thank you. Anybody else? Oops. All right, cool, thank you guys very much. Very lively discussion today, it was really good. Uh, just please put your comments into the PRs that are out there, and uh, we'll talk again next week. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Bye.